a lot, uh, Oliver. Thanks a lot, Oliver, for opening up. A warm welcome this evening also from my side to our speaker, Petro Valenzuela. We are very glad to have you with us, Petro, but also to all the people already waiting uh, for the presentation to hear. I don't want to delay proceedings much. I just want to point out that the Center for the Study of Social and Global Justice uh, used to be affiliated and a part of the School of Politics and International Relations here at the University of Nottingham. Uh, we have now, since this semester, become independent and we are in the process of developing this uh, independent setup. Very clearly, all our seminars are free of charge. We will continue with organizing seminars uh, and workshops. But nonetheless, in order to facilitate this independent setup, we've established a kind of just giving website with Patreon. Uh, so people uh, voluntarily uh, can support our undertaking. Our first target really is to, to set up an independent website in a professional manner. So we, we are going to uh, instruct somebody to do that for us. And in this respect, we, we would like to start collecting our funds. So I will put the website of this kind of just giving of this, this donation website. I will put that in the chat. Again, there's absolutely no obligation whatsoever to do that, but just uh, as a way to, to let you know about this change in status of the center and our kind of future uh, strategy of establishing a kind of independent presence for critical uh, scholarly research in the service of social and global justice. But now, Back to you, Oliver, and back to our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, um, Andreas. Um, well, I'm really very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Professor uh, Pedro Valenzuela here today. He's a, a leading conflict resolution uh, theorist based at the University uh, of Harvey Ariana in Bogota. Uh, Pedro is also the former director of the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Building in Bogota as well as the former director of the political science department at the University of Harvey, Ar Harvey Oriana. Um, it really is a, an honor to be able to, to introduce uh, Pedro because it's, it's uh, one of the, the great things about uh, Colombian scholarship is, uh, is, is the kind of professionalism and the detail and depth that Colombian scholars have been able to contribute on the topic of armed conflict uh, and, and, and peacemaking. And Pedro really is at the, uh, the top of his game a uh, very well-renowned scholar in Colombia uh, and also in uh, Scandinavian countries. So it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce him and be able to contribute uh, to, to the CSSGJ and our own thinking about conflict. Um, one of the, my own experiences going to Colombia is, uh, you know, the, the, it wasn't really until I went to Colombia that I was able to see scholarship at the crux of the, uh, the, the, the of, of talking about armed conflict and peacemaking. Um, so yeah, and, and uh, Pedro has published many books on this topic. He's also published uh, books on the peace processes in English and Spanish. Um, so yeah, without further ado, the title of today's talk is Untangling the Knot, the End of the Internal Armed Conflict in Colombia. Pedro will be starting his, his talk for about 45 minutes. We'll, we will follow that with 40, 45 minutes for a Q&A. So Pedro, please, over to you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you for the presentation. And indeed, thank you for inviting me to share a few thoughts and reflections around the, the peace process in, in my country. And precisely about what you asked me to do, and that is how, how did we begin to untangle the knot? In other words, how can we explain that finally one of the longest and most destructive internal armed conflicts in Colombia uh, and in Latin America indeed came to, uh, to an end finally in 2016. And the fact that we had not been able to do that was not for lack of trying. We really did try for many, many decades. So that's the real question. How come we did not succeed in 1984, did not succeed in the 1990s in the process from 1998 to 2002, and then how come in 2012, or between 2012 and 2016, we, uh, we managed to get a, an agreement signed with the largest of the guerrilla uh, organizations? I, uh, 
I hope that um, because of course I feel much more comfortable writing than speaking just because I do not have, or I hope I do not have an accent when I write, but I do have an accent. I'm very conscious of that when I speak, particularly to a British audience. You know, we are much more familiar with, with the American accent than with the British accent. I hope that's not an, an impediment for us to, to understand each other. So let's try to, uh, to begin to answer the question, why now? Uh, but before, you know, before getting to that point, I think it's very convenient for me to give you at least a background, particularly if you're not very familiar with, with Colombia. The, the simple answer is that many things changed from 1994 uh, to uh, 2012 uh, that can explain why finally a formula that we all kind of knew that was the formula to solve this conflict was floating around. But how come it became acceptable to both parties in the 2000s? So, so but what I mean by a change of trends is let me let me explain the what happened as of the as of 1982. And the reason I begin with 1982 and not with the 1960s when the FARC uh, were created is because uh, during the 1960s and 1970s, the, uh, the FARC was really, and the war in Colombia was really a marginal phenomenon. It did not have much of an impact. Uh, you know, all the, uh, the war has been so long that we speak of first generation guerrillas and second generation guerrillas. And of course the FARC and the ELN and the EPL uh, are, members of what we refer to as first generation guerrillas. Uh, they were all created in the 1960s, although the FARC had a few precedents in the 1950s. And uh, they were all leftist, they, um, and precisely part of the reason that they, the three groups emerged that does, as that first generation guerrillas was their ideological differences. You remember in the 1960s, the big schism between Moscow and, and, and Beijing, and the Communist Party of Colombia, which is the really the creator of the FARC, uh, well, was very much, let's say, aligned with Moscow, while the EPL was more, much more of a Maoist type of organization, and the ELN much more inspired by the Cuban Revolution and, uh, and Che Guevara's type of theories of guerrilla warfare, and with some impact on theology of liberation from the Catholic Church, which explains why some of the militants were nuns and priests. All right, so, but it was a rather marginal phenomenon. The guerrillas were not uh, near the cities. They were rather isolated in rural areas of recent settlement by farmers or poor farmers expelled from previous waves of, 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 of warfare or violence. But in the 1980s, the FARC decided to expand. Uh, so, I'm sorry, so they were created in the 60s, but in the 70s, they only expanded out of their historical areas of presence to two areas in the country, both of them very rural, very far from the capital city, et cetera. And they were not very large in terms of uh, combatants or resources. Uh, and that's precisely one of the criticisms that all the guerrilla uh, organizations in Colombia uh, advanced against the FARC, was that they were isolated, that they did not constitute a threat to anything, that they did not have a major impact in Colombian politics. And that uh, Colombia, it was no longer uh, in the 1970s and 80s, the country that it was when FARC was created. In other words, it was no longer a rural country that now most Colombians lived in the cities and therefore the, uh, the focus of the armed struggle should be the cities in not the rural areas. Uh, so in the 1980s, at the beginning of the 1980s, the FARC came to, to that conclusion as well. We, if we really have want to have an impact we really have to leave the rural areas. We have to come closer to the important economically, politically, administratively, the important centers, the cities. Now it was estimated that 75% of the population lived in the cities. Uh, unlike when the FARC was created with about 70% lived in the rural areas, okay? So they decided to expand. And expanding of course means resources. You know, as we know, wars are expensive and sustaining a significant army is very expensive. So they, they began a process of, of getting resources. I will explain to you a little bit of, about that. They also decided then to come closer to the cities to urbanize the war. And this is a context in Latin America where there are many guerrilla wars going on at the same time with leftist organizations. So we have a shining path in Peru as of, the, as of 1980, we do have the struggles going on in Central America, particularly Guatemala and El Salvador, 
and we have, uh, of course, the Sandinistas in, in power in Nicaragua. So, so there is a whole, you know, Latin American wide revolutionary struggle going on. Uh, and then uh, that growth really worried, uh, not so much because of FARC, I must say, but because of M19, which was a, a probably what we could describe as a social democratic type of organization rather than a Marxist Leninist organization. Uh, and um, anyway, it, they caused an impact. All the, the guerrilla movements became significantly, they had grown dramatically, they have come closer to the cities. So that prompted the first peace process with the Betancourt administration. Uh, before there was a significant change in the vocabulary, you know, in the narrative. This president, who was from the Conservative Party, curiously enough, did, stopped calling the guerrillas bandits or uh, anything like that. He began to refer to them as my Colombian brothers that have taken up arms. So there was a, a change there in the vocabulary that was very interesting, and that gave way to the first to the first peace process. And that peace process lasted probably for about uh, five years, or not for about three years before it collapsed. It was basically an opportunity where several of the guerrillas of the moment signed the peace agreement. The FARC didn't. But the other important groups, uh, the EPL, which was a Maoist group, and M19, the social democratic group, they signed the peace agreement with other minor guerrilla organizations. They signed, uh, others signed the ceasefire, the FARC among them. And that gave the FARC the first opportunity to take part in institutional politics. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for the peace of the country and for the history of the country, that political party created by the FARC was systematically eliminated. Uh, systematically. I mean, all the people that were elected to Congress by them, with the exception of one, were murdered. Two of the presidential candidates were murdered. And of course, the whole, the whole peace process uh, collapsed. FARC went back to the war, etc. So we go to the 1990s. I think, uh, let me have to do this here. The 1990s. The, the 1990s is really the, the moment where the FARC became the strongest. And I'm referring almost exclusively to the FARC because it is with them that we signed the peace agreement. The other guerrilla organizations are still in the war. Uh, so uh, some important things I, I think is important to mention here, you know, that independence or autonomy that the FARC acquired, particularly because they distanced themselves. There, there was a, a break between the Communist Party and the FARC. And uh, so they began to create their own clandestine structures. They were no longer, let's say, a branch or the armed branch of the Communist Party. And that rupture, as I understand it, was because some sectors of the Communist Party were criticizing the armed struggle. Uh, this that they considered that it was not leading anywhere and that it was actually counterproductive. Uh, and they, of course, as I mentioned, they needed resources. So they expanded to areas of economic boom, particularly areas of coal production, oil, gold, uh, cattle ranching, uh, commercial agriculture, uh, and of course, the uh, drug trafficking. That was a slow process where FARC began to, to get involved with the illicit uh, economy. Uh, first, they began by protecting peasants, in their ex uh, peasants that were growing coca, in their exchange with the drug traffickers. As you know, it's a very, very bloody uh, business, and sometimes the peasants got killed and the drug traffickers take the money, I mean, their, their crops. So far began to protect the peasants in that uh, transaction. Then they began to charge uh, drug traffickers uh, a tax uh, every time that uh, a plane left the Colombian jungles uh, with, uh, you know, with cocaine. And then they began to protect those labs for money from the drug traffickers. And they, they themselves began to have their own coca production areas. Uh, so it was a very slow process as I understand it from what uh, some people that are close to them have told me, they actually debated for about a year whether they should get involved in this type of uh, economy, uh, because they kind of perceived that it could be problematic as well. But they decided that they would do it because they did not want to alienate their support base, which was basically poor farmers. And those poor farmers were engaged in, in growing coca. So it is a time where the farm has become so strong, they had about 15,000 by this time, 12,000 or 15,000 combatants uh, that they, and they had developed a tremendous military capacity. They were able to confront the army directly. 
and, and emerged out of those battles successfully. You know, uh, uh, you know in, in one of them, for instance, an attack against a military base defended by professional soldiers, not by just re any recruits, but by professional soldiers. The FARC killed about 30 of them and took out as, as captive, as hostages, about 60, 60 more. So there was, there was a moment where they had in, in, in captivity more than 300 Colombian soldiers. So that gives you an idea of how strong a guerrilla force they had become and that they felt comfortable enough to confront the army directly. Since they began to operate strongly in the, in the cities, they also had urban militias in, in all of the major and even uh, medium cities of the, of the country. Uh, it also, you know, there was something very interesting there because in the 1990s, we um, undertook a process of decentralization, political de and administrative decentralization. So the municipalities became a very important actor. So the FARC decided that one of their strategies was to become very strong at the local level. Uh, and that allowed them to participate in, you know, in development plans at the local level, uh, in, uh, of course, benefiting from the budget of the municipalities. So the local level became an, an important part of the, of the whole thing. And they actually managed to participate in politics, in legal politics, of course, but clandestinely in the sense that they created alliances with some of the political forces, institutional political forces. So they became militarily very strong and uh, uh, politically they were getting uh, more and more uh, control at the local level. So uh, uh, then of course that also forced two more peace processes uh, with the Gaviria administration and then with uh, the Pastrana administration. From the first of these peace processes that I just mentioned, a new constitution emerged in 1991, which was very liberal, a lot of guarantees or democratic rights. Uh, it was considered to be like a peace agreement with those guerrillas that signed the peace agreement in 1990. But again, the FARC was left out of that, of that process. And so the, the, uh, the war uh, intensified. So the first change, because so far what I've been telling you is that the FARC was winning the war. You know, in the sense that uh, throughout the 1990s, they became extremely strong and they were exercising control in many, in many towns. For instance, uh, after the, the peace process in, 19, in 2002 uh, ended, when the president decided that, that it didn't go anymore, they, uh, they, uh, they were controlling about 160 mun municipalities of the country. And the country has about 1,100. And a lot of the mayors could not govern from their municipalities. They had to go to the capital city or the province. And in many of those towns, the police had been expelled by the, by the FARC. So by 2003, when the, the process, peace pro, the last peace process ended in 2002, and then uh, by that time, about uh, you know, 250 mayors uh, were governing from the provincial capitals. So that gives you an idea of how strong the FARC had become. They, they was also, this was also a time where they had, were kidnapping a lot of political figures, particularly at the local level, in order to force them to abide by their, by their programs and by their, the projects that they had for the, for the localities. Uh, but then the whole thing it began to change, particularly after 2003. And the reason, well, because of changes that had begun to be implemented since 1999, and these were essentially military reforms. Uh, and again, we cannot put this factor aside because it is a war, you know, so the, the, uh, the military correlation of forces is going to have a, a, a big weight in the decisions and the estimations of the actors of the war. So the thing is that as of 1999, and with of course a huge military aid from the United States, the Colombian army, they implemented some reforms that really gave them the advantage in the war. So throughout the 90s, the FARC is growing, becoming strong. They are hitting the army very, very strongly, and they are exercising political control in about you know, two, 200 municipalities or whatever. So the army becomes much more professional. As of 2003, uh, there is huge improvement in their uh, intelligence gathering uh, capacities. They acquired the capacity to fight at night with these, I don't know, goggles, or I don't know how, you, how, how would you call them. 
they create mobile brigades, airborne troop with airborne troops, so they could go from one place to the from the country to another place in the country, wherever they were needed, very very quickly. Uh, but particularly, there was one factor that was very important in in inclining the balance in favor of the state, and that was the use of the air force. So the air force began because of uh, better intelligence that they had now. Uh, the Air Force began to locate the camps of the FARC. And for the first time in history, they were able to kill some of the top leaders of the FARC. And they did this through bombings. So the use of the Air Force was extremely important uh, to, uh, you know, to begin to weaken the FARC as well. So perhaps for the first time in many, many years, uh, FARC was on the run. They, uh, you know, be, um, before they were controlling a lot of strategic rear guards that now no, there was no safe place for them. Really. They were running. And again, because of the bombings, there was a very famous bombing uh, on the other side of the Ecuadorian border that created a huge international uh, conflict with Ecuador because they actually bombed a camp in Ecuadorian territory where they killed the so-called uh, foreign minister of the FARC, Raul Reyes. And they killed one of the main military strategies in Mono Jojoy in another bombing. Then they located the top commander of the FARC, the location of the top commander, and they killed him, not in, in a bombing, but apparently they executed him. Uh, so they were really, you know, the, the tide, the military tide was turning definitely in favor of the state. Uh, so the FARC was not defeated, but they were perhaps strategically defeated. I think there was a point where the FARC understood the military victory was simply impossible. And, uh, and that was, I think, a, a, a factor that began to, uh, to have a, a, a huge impact. You know, the government that came to power in 2002, which was a right-wing uh, government, uh, which in a country that's conservative and Colombia to refer to someone as right-wing is really, you know, an indication of how extreme right these guys were. Uh, and, and he came, with the strong decision to recover the national territory and the hands of the state, uh, to rebuild all the police stations that had been uh, destroyed by, by the war, by the FARC, and to, to really control all the municipalities uh, of the country. So there's a huge offensive, particularly as I mentioned, as of 2003. And then you notice that as of 2000, perhaps and five, six or seven, the initiative of the combat is uh, in the hands of the armed forces of the state, not on the FARC. Before, most combats were initiated by FARC. Now they are on the defensive, but most combats are initiated by the, uh, by the National Army. So what happened here is that uh, they, I think the FARC understood that they could not really make that transition to a real army. And they went back to a traditional guerrilla warfare. So their, their main strategy was ambushes, uh, attacks on the infrastructure, uh, and of course, the same strategies of, uh, of mining, mining territories so the army could not penetrate. Uh, and of course, the, you know, the, the financial situation, the acquisition of, of resources that was uh, really was maintaining them uh, alive, let's say. Uh, that then that is to give you an idea of how the military situation changed. I'd like to show you this very quickly. These maps. The peace process began in 1998, 99 with the Pastrana administration, uh, and you see the the more intense the red, the red color, the more intense the confrontations in the area. So two things I like to call your attention to: that the FARC is pretty much everywhere. The only white area in the south of the map is the Amazon jungle. Uh, the rest uh, where Colombians live, the mountainous areas and the flat land uh, and the Caribbean and Pacific coasts, uh, as you see, their presence is everywhere. In some parts, then the, the combats and the confrontation is much more intense than in others, but they are pretty much everywhere in the country. So we come to 1999, they are negotiating already. Uh, there's a negotiations between the Colombian state and the FARC but they decided not to have a ceasefire as a precondition for negotiations. So they are negotiating as, as the war goes on. That's why throughout all these years of negotiation, you will see that there are combats uh, all over the country. 
2000, they are still negotiating. 2001, negotiating. And then 2002, and the government decides that the peace process is over. So you see a, a tremendous inter intensification of, of, of combat. Uh, and the largest red area that you see there is the area where the FARC was originally born. Uh, and uh, But you see that in the border with Venezuela, the combats are very strong. And in the uh, border with Ecuador uh, to the south as well. And of course, in the historical areas of presence. So the war between 2006, 2002 and 2007 or, or six perhaps is extremely intense. But as I mentioned, uh, the initiative is in the hands of the armed forces of the state. This is 2003, very intense everywhere in the country. 2004, five, six, perhaps the, the most intense year. And then you begin to see a, a decline in the intensity of the confrontation. 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2010. And unfortunately, that, that is the last year that these maps were produced. And, and I don't really know what the reason is, but if you keep in mind that the peace process began in 2010, I'm sorry, and 12, uh, perhaps they decided, you know, we, we don't want to show the real military situation to the rest of the country. I'm not sure. I'd like to point out two things. They are still pretty much everywhere in the country. It's just that the intensity of the confrontations it has uh, changed dramatically. So that is that is like the first point that I like to, to point out uh, the, the changes that took place there. The military correlation of forces. Then there are very important changes in the regional context of the war. As I mentioned in the 1990s, uh, there was a Latin American wide type of revolutionary effort, uh, particularly in Central America and, and Peru. Uh, but then all this has changed by the time that the FARC decided to negotiate with the Colombian state. Uh, the Salvadoran guerrillas signed a peace agreement in 1992. The war was over. The Guatemalan guerrillas signed a, a peace agreement in 1996. And the leftist regime in Nicaragua lost the elections in 1991. Uh, and therefore, and Sendero Luminoso was defeated in Peru. So all of a sudden, this Latin American wide revolutionary struggle is no longer there. And the Colombian guerrillas are the only ones that remain uh, in the struggle. So I think that was a very important, a very important uh, factor in terms of the estimations that the FARC and other guerrilla movements are doing. There's also some sort of a transition, however mild, let's say, in terms of the political projects of these leftist forces in other, in other parts of the continent. Uh, that are showing that perhaps coming uh, to power in, uh, you know, through institutional channels with a much more moderate, let's put it that way, a political project might give a chance to these alternative forces uh, to, uh, to do well in politics, in institutional politics. Something that before was completely out of the question. We, there were periods where we had either uh, open military dictatorships or very authoritarian civilian regimes. Colombia, you know, despite of the fact that the Colombian political and economic elites like to claim that we have been, the, that we are the longest democracy in Latin America, well, that's using the term democracy very generously, to put it, to put it mildly. It's truly an anocracy, you know, with some features of democratic societies and with some very important features of authoritarian regimes. And so I think that's also a very important a change in terms of trends, you know, some political uh, um, clues that perhaps, you know, there are other alternatives there uh, that are not necessarily related to the armed struggle. At the same time that the military situation is changing, of course, the public perception uh, of, uh, of the conflict and of the war is also changing as well. So if you see, for instance, in 2000, uh, between 2005 and 2008, you know, most Colombians felt that the main problem of the country was the armed struggle. And as you can see, as, the, as you know, the intensity of the confrontations is much less, uh, people do not consider that as being the main problem in the country. So it's like an opportunity for them to concentrate again in very pressing issues, such as inequality, poverty, 
uh, exclusion, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those things that were kind of hidden by the war come to the fore in large sectors of society. Uh, support for the, the political solution was very, very widespread uh, throughout the process. And, and I'd like to call your attention to the fact that even when we had between 2002 and 2010, the right-wing government uh, and, and people had voted for them, they voted for a war, they were still uh, thinking that the best solution to the conflict was at the negotiating table. Uh, so I think that public opinion support was also very important in the estimates of, of all actors uh, on the part of the government and on the part of the guerrillas. Uh, this is uh, support for the specific peace process that we were undertaking as of 2012. And you see that the support is high. That 2015 ME, ME uh, means a special sample. Uh, not the national sample, but a sample that was taken from areas where the conflict was very strongly felt. Uh, and as you can see, almost 65% of the people that live in those conflict-ridden areas were supporting the negotiated and the, the current peace process. Others uh, that express a much more high, a much higher support when you ask them the question in abstract: Do you support peace? Do you support negotiated solution? Much, a much higher percentage, percentage said yes, but when you ask them, do you support the current peace process, they were already having trouble with some of the things that were being negotiated in, in Havana. So all these changes, I think, it came to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to determine, oh, I think another important factor, and I, I see that I did not write it there, I think another important factor was that perhaps some sectors, at least within the FARC, felt that they were becoming more and more isolated from the broader social and political struggles of, struggles of Colombia. Uh, because a lot of the social movements were not supporting the armed struggle. In fact, they viewed the armed struggle as a real obstacle for, for them to grow and for them to have an impact. In other words, a lot of sectors, progressive sectors in the country were feeling that the armed struggle uh, really was uh, counterproductive. Uh, that doesn't mean that the fact did not have support. We know that in some places at the local level they did, but I think that there was you know, a, a distancing between the social movement in general and those sectors that were supporting the armed struggle. And I think that was an, an important factor also that the FARC began to consider. Now, on the other hand, you have the state. And here, well, all kinds of explanations I've heard as to why, uh, some more simplistic than others. Uh, I will tell you, of course, mine. Uh, and I, I do not think that it was exclusively an economic consideration, as many, many analysts have suggested. You know, that the Colombian elites saw in the peace process an opportunity to promote the mining industries and, and other extractive industries. I think that's part of it. I'm not discounting their importance. But I think that that, that uh, type of interpretation comes from a very, um, mm, from an interpretation that I don't think is very accurate. And that is co to consider the Colombian state and the Colombian elites as monolithic without any contradictions between themselves. And I do see very, very concrete contradictions between the, the dominant elites in, in the country between some that are much more tied with very traditional, particularly landed interests, and some political and economic elites that want to insert the country into the capital, capitalist uh, world economy, world economy, and that they feel that it is much more convenient to do it in peace times than with these negative uh, you know, factors like the, like the war. So that's one consideration. But I also think that there are, and you can see in some, some of the political projects, certain political and economic elites, elites in the country that consider that the country needs reforms uh, badly, I mean, urgently. And that have, they have to do with, for instance, opening up the political system to alternative forces. Uh, so, so I think there, is a, there was in some sectors of the Colombian elites, uh, an aspiration to quote unquote, modernize the country and of course, by this, they meant uh, uh, you know, to adopt a type uh, of liberal 
type of peace, you know, promoted by the international community and certain interests, but that transcended the simple interest of, of the economic agenda. Let me tell you why. Among other things, because they learned to, to live with the war. The Colombian economic elites, national and international interest, economic interests learned to live with the war. And they simply factored in, you know, in their cost of production, uh, what the uh, security was going to imply uh, for them. And they also invested in their own armies. As you know, the growth of right-wing paramilitary groups were financed to a large extent by traditional elites in the country as well. So, so I don't think that it was, you know, I, I do see uh, very clear contradictions in the interest of some, certain sectors of the Colombian elites that I think it's important. I always tell my Marxist friends, remember the 18th Boomer of Louis Bonaparte, because you will find there are some interesting clues as to, otherwise we have a very monolithic uh, image uh, that would prevent us from understanding the contradictions within the dominant elites that I, I saw very clearly emerging in the peace process. And that you still see today with all the difficulties that we're having to implement what was agreed in Havana. So the peace process began, it had two main phases. One was a secret phase in Havana uh, in the early months of uh, 2012 until August. Uh, nobody knew that they were meeting there. Uh, and I think it was a very important part of the process uh, you know, to, for them to be um, far from the public pressures in Colombia, we still were uh, victims of the syndrome of the last failed process. So there was a lot, a lot of criticism uh, and, and even it was very risky for the, for the president to, to talk to the FARC, but he took the risk and they met in Havana and they were discussing many, many things there. So when we learned that they were uh, in Havana, they already had come to an agreement in terms of what they were going to negotiate about. And I think this is a very important point because FARC had been weak militarily before in the Santos administration. But I think what the Santos administration did or that part of the political elites did was to offer the FARC a, a, uh, an honorable way out of the war. I think the, the previous president was offering them just very few possibilities. You surrender and we will demobilize you and you know, create some sort of DDR program for you guys. But what this guy was telling them is what Christopher Mitchell has mentioned, an enticing opportunity. And that is that they were going to have a real negotiation process and are about substantial issues. I mean, those are the, the agenda is precisely what the conflict has been about. You know, the, the issue of, uh, of the countryside, particularly land tenure, which is a, a serious problem in the country, the issue of a very narrow political system that is not very keen on political opposition. So all these were points that were going to be discussed there. Of course, the issue of the illicit drug economy, which has been like the, one of the most important fuels uh, for the country from all sides, not just from the sides of the guerrillas. So, so I think that's um, yeah what we could call without any, any hesitation, uh, he gave him an enticing opportunity. Uh, otherwise, they could continue. They could have continued in the war, even though they were weakened and in just a traditional um, guerrilla strategy where they had been strategically, strategically, not militarily defeated. So that picture, of course, gave us a lot of uh, hope. This was President Santos on the left, Timochenko, the park top leader on the right, and Cuba's president at, at the time, uh, Raul Castro. But perhaps more than that picture, this one really gave us a lot of hope. That little baby that Timochenko is carrying is the daughter of the guerrilla fighter, the female guerrilla fighter that you see to the right. And that baby would have been the first baby uh, in generations to be born in a country at peace. So, so that was a, an extremely significant picture. But as we know, that has not been uh, things have not uh, gone the way we were expecting. We are confronting very, very serious challenges to the implementation of the peace agreement. And I would like to mention three that I consider are very, very important. One is the slow piece of implementation. And that has to do with the lack of will from the, the, the party in power. Uh, you know, this is a party that always opposed the peace process 
that, uh, that emerged victorious in the referendum by a very narrow margin, but they emerged victorious uh, with uh, all kinds of uh, lies, open, open lies about what had been agreed in, in Havana. And there was a lot of a, a lack of education as to what the peace process really entailed. And a lot of people really believed all those, all those lies. Uh, so yeah, I would say a political force that is strong. Fortunately, they have lost a lot of support. We'll see what happen, will happen in the elections in 2022, uh, because apparently uh, there is a, a good chance that that force that is so anti-peace agreement uh, will be defeated. Yeah, but so far we can not say that, I mean, we have, we have to say that they have been a, a real hurdle in the implementation of the peace agreement. So that's one problem, you know, it's been very slow. Uh, although we have also have to accept that some of the, the points will be implemented in, uh, in something like 15 years, that's more or less the estimated time. The second is security. And the reason is that, um, well, uh, most of the FARC uh, rank and file demobilized, but not all of it. Uh, towards the end of the process, a dissident force emerged that did not agree with the terms of what had been agreed in the, in, in the accord. Uh, and they, were, they either did not sign the peace agreement, never demobilized, or they demobilized and then went back to the, to the armed struggle. Uh, estimates vary as to how many there are, but probably, the, the highest estimate that I've seen is about 4,000 in arms. Uh, now, not all of those 4,000 are people who signed the peace agreement and went back to the armed struggle, See, but new recruits that they are getting in the, in the, it is estimated that probably 80% of the FARC people are still abiding by the terms of the agreement. And they're difficult conditions, because when I mention security, I have to mention that about 300 of the FARC combatants that signed the peace agreement have been murdered. And uh, close to a thousand social leaders, and many of them very closely related to some of the peace agreement uh, points uh, or in the implementation of those points, particularly restitution of land, because here a lot of land was dispossessed uh, from, from poor farmers. Uh, and one of the points of the agreement is restitution of those lands. So there's a lot of opposition from large uh, landowners and from others, other organizations, including in some um, parts of the country by FARC members, those that are not abiding by the peace agreement. So that's also that persecution of social leaders, human rights defenders, environmental leaders, etc., uh, is very, very complex. And uh, the third challenge is political culture. And we must say, I don't know if I have what I have here, but the level of intolerance uh, in Colombia, and particularly for critical sectors or sectors of the opposition, is very, very high. Uh, I just, I think I, I'm concentrating here in these tables only on FARC, the perception of, of people about the FARC at the time that the peace agreement was about to be signed. So they were asked, whether they would accept a FARC ex-combatant as neighbor. And as you can see, uh, less than half the, the survey people answered yes, except a little bit in the areas of conflict, they, about 56%. If you're an entrepreneur, would you hire a, a male ex-combatant? And as you can see, the, the proportion is not very high. When you hire a, a female ex-combatant, a bit better, but not much. Would you allow your friend or daughter to become friends with uh, a FARC ex-combatant? And as you can see, uh, people are not very willing uh, to do that. Uh, they were also asked a lot about, uh, you know, whether they would agree uh, to give an amnesty to a rank and file. And as you can see, the percentage is not very high. Would you agree to reduce their sentences? Uh, you know, in exchange for conf confession of the crimes, uh, again, not very high. Would you agree to reduce sentences if they contribute to the mining? Because they are the ones that know where the mines are. And as you know, the mining is extremely, extremely expensive and, and, and cumbersome. Uh, the agreement says that if you confess 
uh, you will receive a prison, no, not a prison, I should change that. It's actually, hmm, how to say this in English? You lose your freedom, but you don't, do not necessarily go to jail. So you can serve, you can be not in jail, but with a lot of restrictions on your liberty. And that is from five to eight years. And most people, as you see, are not happy with that, that you prefer, that you prefer more than eight years uh, for them to, to be without the freedom. And this is very telling as well, because five to eight years is what the paramilitary, the right wing paramilitary groups were given, and nobody seemed to complain much when that when that happened. Uh, if they confess the crimes, do you think that that would help reconciliation in the country? If they repair the victims, if they serve a five to eight year sentence or more than eight years, you see it's not all these, all these measures that are being very heavily promoted by the international community in order to achieve reconciliation, people are a bit in this belief that they will actually contribute to a reconciliation. And oh, this is what I wanted to, to show you. See, when I refer to a political culture that is not very conducive to democracy and peace, is that uh, um, you know, just a little bit of over 40% of the Colombian population believe that critics of the system have the right to be elected. And of course, the, the main point of the peace process is for the FARC not to stop doing politics, but, but to start doing politics through institutional channels instead of, of, of through weapons. Uh, freedom of expression, critics of the system do have the right to express themselves freely. As you see, less than 50% say yes. Uh, should critics of the system have the right to vote? 50% say yes. So in other words, half the country doesn't think that critics of the system should have the right to vote. And a little bit, probably 55% agree that critics of the system should have the right to, to undertake peaceful demonstrations. Uh, and I think this is the last one. Would you support FARC participation in politics? Uh, 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 should the government give the FARC guarantees, and the party, not the guerrilla, the, the party to participate in politics, as you can see, the support is very, very low for, for that. Uh, should they have the right to constitute a political party? Very few agree with that. Uh, should they participate in local elections? And should they have political representation, not in elected posts, but in posts that are, uh, you know, selected instead of elected? And so, so as you can see, there is a lot of a lot of hurdles that I think is going to be very very difficult for us to overcome. This is a very very polarized country now. Uh, with regards to this, I do see some signs of hope in the sense that a lot of people are so committed, particularly at the grassroots, so committed to peace, so persistent and so resilient in their efforts that, uh, that I cannot be but uh, surprised and thankful, you know, uh, because for an academic like myself to speak of human rights or social justice or, or peace really, in the context of a renowned university in the capital city, it doesn't really uh, entail much risk. But for a lot of people in the countryside, and particularly in those areas where the conflict is still being waged, to just mention one of those three words is really to put yourself uh, as a target for somebody. Uh, and that they, they do it. I haven't seen one, one place in my country where you go and you don't find the women's organizations and LGBTI community and uh, black organizations and peasant organizations and you know working for peace, uh, despite all these uh, obstacles that I have been mentioning to you. So I see there, you know, the uh, the possibilities and in sectors of the elite that are still defending the peace agreement and uh, and and v viewing the peace agreement as a real uh, possibility for us to construct a much more peaceful country. So with that, I, I think uh, those are my ideas around why, uh, what changed for the peace agreement to become a reality and some of the obstacles that I see towards the future. I'd like to, to thank you very much, uh, Professor Valenzuela, for, for that excellent talk. You covered a lot of history there and you did it in a, uh, I'm sure everyone would agree with, in a very detailed and, and thorough way. So, so thank you very much for that um, really interesting talk. 
We're going to be turning over to a Q&A now, question and answers. We've got about um, 35, 37 minutes for a question and answer session. Um, so yeah, if anyone would like to go first, Pedro, if I could ask you to turn off your, your screen share so we can all see each other and have a bit of a, a social uh, atmosphere to the, to the best that we can uh, online. Um, that will be great. Oops, where is it? So just bottom, Oops. bottom, middle um, on Zoom should be able to find it. So maybe, okay. There we go. So who would like to go first uh, in terms of, would you like to take a few questions at a time, Pedro, or one at a time? What do you prefer? Sure, let's hear a few. Yeah. Yeah. Andreas? Oliver, if I could just interject at this date. So colleagues can either directly ask Pedro or if they prefer, they can also raise a question in the chat. I'm going to monitor the chat and can then transfer the, the questions to Pedro. And perhaps Pedro, we've got already one contribution by our colleague, uh, Andy Higginbottom. If I could just run that past you. Uh, Andy writes, uh, and he has to leave to another meeting, but he writes uh, that he appreciates your analysis, but his understanding is that the land reform was quite limited when there were negotiations in, in Havana and that especially the economy was off the agenda of those negotiations. So the social economic drivers of the conflict have simply not gone away. Several hundred social activists assassinated were, have been assassinated since 2016 something you also mentioned uh, in your presentation. And so the, this repression heightened during the power national. Is, is, so we, we've got, if, if you don't, uh, if you could just all mute your micros, apologies. So this repression heightened during the power national is this post-conflict. So the, the question really, what was there substantially to be negotiated in Havana really, or was perhaps the FARC so much in a weak spot that it just had to accept whatever was on offer? Yeah, one thing, I think it's right to say that the economic model was out of the question. That's why you mentioned it's all liberal peace. And, uh, but if the, if the essentials of the economic model were out of the question, reforms to the economic questions were not. In other words, we have to be very pragmatic in these matters as well. And uh, you just don't negotiate revolutions at all. You negotiate reforms. That is precisely what made it acceptable. Otherwise, of course, had they far demanded a, a, a deep uh, you know, structural reform of the system, the, the negotiations would not have gone anywhere. So we have to start from that limitation. Uh, and, and the standard that limitation, yes, the, the economic model, it was not touched, the essentials are there. And therefore, the, as somebody mentions here, I think it's Andy, I think, you no, know, Karen, as uh, uh, the issue, I mean, the land reform was never a radical land reform. It is, uh, that's why I spoke more of modernization in the terms of, for instance, that there's a lot of, in, uh, well, there's land restitution as part of the negotiations, uh, incredibly difficult to implement, and there has been no kind of legal as well as as um, non-legal uh, obstacles to, to getting that. That's going very, very slow, and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of much more commitment on the part of the state to, to do it. So the, the idea was not a radical agrarian reform, but to leave, to give a land, access to land, to landless peasants. That doesn't mean necessarily touching the interest of the large landowners, that is very clear. And so we have to understand it in that, in that, um, from that perspective. It was reforms that would allow a sector that have been traditionally excluded to be much more integrated into the systems than they were, uh, and, uh, but nothing, nothing more than that. However, I also think that we should be very, very careful in, in dismissing this as unimportant. To a lot of people, as I explained, uh, this is a foundational type of peace. It's not a definitive type of peace. In other words, if we saw it, many of us saw it as an opportunity to really create spaces for social struggle. Uh, not, not for the end of the social struggle, but, but to create and open up spaces, democratic spaces for participation. 
And if you read the, the, um, the agreement, that's what the agreement contemplates. And that's why I don't agree very much that it was simply a matter of getting uh, the big multinational companies to come and do extraction of, of oil, coal, or whatever resources. Because all those programs of participation at the grassroots level in those territories certainly can act as an, as an obstacle for that to take place without any consideration. Yeah, so yeah, but it has limitations. Again, let's not believe that the, pro, the, the peace agreement solved the social problems of the conflict. It op of, of the, yeah, the social problems of the country, it opened up spaces for struggle, not to bring the struggle to an end. If, I hope I may receive clean on that. Uh, the issue of land reform should be helpful for gaining support for FARC. If they manage, you have to do it. Uh, but I really don't know. It, um, I think this is Karen. I really don't know, Karen, how much of the of the of the land is owned by USA corporations, by large landowners, the vast majority. Uh, in other words, a, a large chunk of land in Colombia is controlled by very few interests. I just cannot tell you the US part. Uh, I really now you have awakened a certain curiosity. I don't think it's as bad, of course, as it was in, in Guatemala, for instance, with the United Fruit Company, but there are interests there, both national and, and international. Uh, uh, the social economic drivers of the company have simply not gone away. Uh, absolutely uh, in agreement with that. And as I mentioned, one of the problems has been that a lot of the, the people who are involved with implementation, particularly social leaders, human rights defenders, and, uh, and environmental, defenders are being targeted by, by many, many interests, of course, that do not want what, what is in the agreement to be implemented. And that's why I say it's not, it's not a minor issue what, what is in the agreement, even if it's not what we perhaps wanted as a much more encompassing and you know, deep uh, type of, uh, of, um, of reforms. Uh, I don't know what else is there. I don't, I don't see anything else in so, the chat. So, uh, Andreas, Andreas, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a, a question? Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Petro, for that, that uh, very interesting analysis uh, of the conflict and peace process in Colombia. I've got a question. You did mention the United States support for the Colombian military, but only very briefly, otherwise you focus a bit on the kind of Colombian terror, including the differences and tensions within the ruling elite. But can we just bypass the US involvement so briefly? Was that not pretty decisive, especially when it came to the turnaround in military fortunes, yes. not yes. just the military support, but also perhaps even instructions on yeah. the ground. And, and I'm always wondering, why would the US put so much emphasis on Colombia? We had the pink tide across Latin America, but it really seemed to be Colombia where the US seemed to concentrate its efforts even more than vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. How can we understand mm -hmm. that kind of engagement and intervention yeah. from the US perspective? Mm -hmm. Colombia has always been, of course, a critical ally of the United States, you know, and that's, that's a, uh, that's a, a, a foreign policy decision that was adapt, adopted very early on. And, uh, you know, a, an Austrian author has referred to that as follow the North Star. That's what the Colombian elites decided. We will follow the North Star. And they have done so very faithfully, I must say. Uh, so, uh, yes, the support from the US has been from the very beginning, even in the old violencia, the old violence. They, uh, but of course, as the FARC became, or the guerrillas in general were becoming a real threat, it became more and more, much more um, decisive. And you're right, I mean, the, the Plan Colombia, the Plan Colombia, which is the program that began precisely as the Pastrana administration uh, undertook the peace process of the late 1990s and beginning of, of the 2000s, uh, was initially, much more inclined towards some sort of social type of what some refer to as the Marshall Plan for Colombia. But it was very rapidly changed in the United States to uh, 
to a much more military type of, of, of plan. And initially, what they attempted to do, at least, you know, paying lip service to it, was that the anti-guerrilla struggle is supported by the US would remain separate from the anti-drug, uh, you know, trafficking uh, struggle. Little by little, those things, those two things merged. And the argument that they gave was that the FARC was so heavily involved in, in drug trafficking that it was impossible for, for you know, to, se to separate the two. So indeed, it was crucial. Uh, but also let's understand something in, in the role of the United States. For instance, in Central America, it was also, uh, you know, the United States, the one that precluded, we could say, uh, uh, that prevented uh, an FMLN victory in El Salvador you know, in the first final offensive of 1982. But if we, we also saw a change in the role of the United States towards the end of the conflict, where they began to put pressure on the Colombia, on the Salvadorian uh, government to, to open up the system and, and negotiate with the guerrillas. Something like that happened in Colombia in the sense that at least they did not, they did not oppose the peace negotiations. So sometimes, you know, when you're a Latin American, uh, if the United States doesn't say anything, it's, it's good news, you know, because normally we are very used to, to the, that every time they open their mouth, some, their mouth, something bad is going to happen. But this time they kept quiet. And in fact, as you remember, they actually sent an envoy, both to Costa Rica, which created a huge political scandal in the United States, uh, and also to Havana. I don't remember his name, but the fact that they did not openly said no to the peace agreement, you know, the, the, the the, uh, the solution has to be a military solution and that they actually sent envoys you know to the to meet with the representatives i think it was a good a good sign uh, so uh, but yes you're right in the question uh, the decisive decisive role not, uh, in changing the military correlation of forces much of that of those reforms to the military modernization intelligence um, you know night combat uh, cap capability all that is result of, of, of US uh, contribution. Yes, training, of course, but the training is not that new. It has always been part of it. Uh, what was disputed at some point was the role of milit US military on the ground, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly to what extent they actually uh, participated in that. We know that uh, some, uh, we could call them mercenaries perhaps, from the United States have participated because they have been killed and they have been taken prisoners by the FARC. So we know that they exist. Uh -huh. um, we've got a couple questions here. Um, Ertan, if you'd like to go first, and then Joanna. Okay, thanks a lot for the excellent presentation. And also, thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, what I would like to ask uh, is, I, mean, I have two questions, two short questions. And the first would be, I mean, I was quite surprised to see one of the slides that you showed in 2014, 2015, the support for a political solution was yeah. almost 77% or 80%, right? Yeah. And yeah. two years later, the referendum was lost very slim uh, majority. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I mean, what was shocking was the participation, right? If I'm not mistaken, the participation was quite yeah. low. So mm -hmm. I remember you've also mentioned in your presentation, I remember the smear campaign, the, I mean, that Timoshenko will be the president and millions of dollars the FARC uh, members will receive, or the country will be Venezuela, which is, the, I mean, it's the, the Latin American, uh, the most common uh, thing, you know, in every elections, it will, it's, it's now must, right? Uh, this country will turn to Venezuela. So there was a huge campaign from the mainstream media, etc. But can we can we only explain this low participation with this uh, campaign? Can you further elaborate that point? That will be my first question. I mean, maybe the, the opposition against the Santos government administration or the economic uh, process or the, the, the mistakes done throughout the, the, the peace process. That would be my first question. And the second question would be, I mean, many things happened since and 2019 and 2021. Recently, there was a huge uh, wave of protests, right? Uh, so, of course, I mean, everyone would agree that uh, uh, the, the, the bad implementation or non-implementation or 
or uh, sabotaging by urbists, right? The, the, the implementation of the, the, the peace process might be a part of those uh, protests, but what would, would be the scale? I mean, uh, do you think it plays a significant role uh, in the protests in 2019 and 2021? Thanks a lot, cheers. Yeah, let, let me see if I can answer it. Uh, yeah, because it's of course very paradoxical, you know, that uh, for so long people were supporting the peace agreement and all of a sudden we lost, you know, when, when it was time to, uh, to vote. Uh, but I, I also showed another slide where I showed that in abstract, the support for the peace agreement was uh, for the negotiations were much more uh, higher than uh, were higher than the, when they asked him about, about that specific peace agreement. If you remember, then it went down dramatically, and that is because people already were in the middle of uh, you know uh, they were beginning to know what had been agreed. Uh, you know, at the end of each round, the, they published what had been agreed. And of course, that gave opponents of the peace agreement a lot of uh, a lot of uh, opportunities. Let's say to criticize what had been agreed, and with the campaign of sneer that you that you mentioned. So that's what I, what I can explain. One thing is supporting abstract for a negotiated solution, and one is once they begin to know exactly what's happening in this peace process, and then the support went down dramatically, and then once the the uh, you know the campaign began for us to decide whether yes or not to approve it as you know the things that happened and it wasn't just not just that uh, we were giving the country to the FARC there were also all kinds of uh, falsehoods in terms that uh, you know education in the educational system was going to be because they wanted to turn all our kids into homosexuals uh, all kinds of really crazy things but but very but very but very misleading in terms of what was agreed uh, and of course, the issue of justice. The issue of justice has been very heavy, as I tried to show. It. The FARC really managed to create a lot of antagonism in the people. And as you see, they have not done well in elections at all uh, when you compare it to other guerrilla organizations that have participated in elections. Uh, and so, yeah, all kinds of reasons as to when in abstract and when it really had to happen. The Palo Nacional that, that you are mentioning has, of course, many many, many, many reasons. Among them, the, the fact that, uh, that people feel that a lot of the promises of the, of the peace agreement have not been uh, materialized. They have not materialized. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of frustration because of that, but also other factors you know, that are more conjunctural. We know for a fact that the pandemic increased unemployment among the youth. Uh, among women as well. They are the two most affected. They, uh, they have been the two most affected sectors by the pandemic and, uh, and, and dramatically so. And the way the government also handled the whole thing was not very, was not very appropriate, let's say. So that increased a lot of discontent. But as um, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, the social, the social problems of this country of exclusion, of discrimination are still there. The, among other things, because the peace agreement has not been implemented in its totality, and because there is a lot of uh, a lot of um, opposition uh, to that, uh, and let us remember, it's a very mild type of reforms that they propose, but that they have some impact in terms of affecting some interests, and therefore there is a lot of opposition to that. So yeah, I, I think that there is uh, junctural or conjunctural factors that have increased discontent. A, uh, a discontent that was coming from before. The peace process generated expectations. Those expectations have not been fulfilled a, uh, and, uh, and finally exploded in, into something that was very conjunctural because as you remember, it was because of the, the proposal of a tax reform that, um, that as usual was very regressive. Uh, so yeah, it's a combination of factors, let's say gave rise to that. Now, another thing is to what extent has it been sustained? Because I really, I'm a bit lost as to the, the current situation, but, uh, but I don't know if it has lost some of its momentum because it was really, it was really you know, massive at some point. A lot of repression on the part of the state. Uh, and, and I don't know, I haven't heard that, that it has been sustained. Hmm? 
And thanks for that, uh, Pedro. We have um, two two more questions. Um, I'll uh, first, um, Joanna, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, hello, Pedro, and Hi. thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Um, regarding your presentation, I would like to ask you. Uh, how uh, or if there is a relation uh, between peace talks and the military strategy the illegal armed actors follow. You mentioned mainly guerrillas, but I would like to explore more the paramilitary forces. Uh, how do you find the fact of these talks on their military strategy? Well, I think there's a Digamo, let's say that I got to see you, first of all, it's been a while, and, uh, and I know that you're in England now and your English has improved dramatically from what I can see. That's good. Well, I think you remember that the first, the first military, uh, paramilitary, the emergence of the first paramilitary groups was really very much related to the first peace process. Uh, in other words, uh, the argument that was given by a lot of uh, people that felt threatened uh, by the participation of the guerrillas in politics was that they had been abandoned by the central state. And that this is particularly the case of the first, group, the first groups in Cordoba. And they said the, the local elites felt the Colombian state has abandoned us and they really have given us, they have delivered us you know, to the hands of the guerrillas. So if the Colombian state is not here to protect us, we will protect ourselves. And I think it's, uh, it's something very similar. Every time that we have spoken about, about uh, peace, uh, we see you know, the, the rebirth or, or the reinforcement of these, these types of, of armed expressions. So a lot of what's happening now, is, of course a reaction to these potential reforms, as mild as they may sound, uh, as I said, they do have an impact. And it's a, a reform to, I mean, a reaction to all the potential reforms that the peace agreement has and how that's going to impact different, different organizations. Uh, so, and that also is very interesting that it, it's even also part of the reaction of, of the FARC dissidents to some of the points of the implementation of the peace agreement. And particularly those FARC groups that are more involved in drug trafficking, because as you know, a lot of the, the farmers, the poor farmers that have been willing to accept the substitution plans promoted by the agreement they are being attacked by all the armed actors because they don't want, of course, them to stop producing, to uh, growing coca. Uh, so, but I do see, I think you're right in that, there is a reaction of, of sectors that feel threatened by the peace agreement and, and a state that unfortunately is either unable to control them or as we fear, many of us, there is a recreation of those links between political economic class, particularly at the local level, and these paramilitary forces. Yes, I will say also regular armed forces and paramilitary forces, yes, right? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. indeed. And like you know, the state, you know, the state uh, has always had links with uh, drug trafficking. I don't think that we can deny that. And of course, with paramilitary groups, uh, and we know this uh, for certain. Uh, that's why, for instance, I'm convinced that what's going to emerge in the report of the Truth Commission is not a matter that it, we're, going to, we're going to learn many new things. I think we know what happens because we do have a tradition, social organizations, human rights organizations, and even the Colombian state, and I like to emphasize that the Colombian state is not monolithic, and this is a state that sectors of it are allied with the paramilitary groups, and sectors of it are very much critical of the paramilitary groups. And all you have to do is to read the reports of some of the uh, instances of the Colombian state to see, uh, to see my point. You know, so some, so some state sectors allied with the paramilitary groups, some sectors very critical of the paramilitary groups, and you see them in the official reports of the Colombian state. And I think that people interested in, in peace building should keep that in mind, those divisions within the elites because they are there. And if we choose to ignore it for a very, very simplistic understanding of the country situation, we will be missing opportunities to find ways to work with these sectors that are um, you know, interested in, in, in having a, a different country. 
just a short follow-up questions regarding your answer. And it's uh, what's happening then with these empty spaces that Guerrilla left in the drug market? You see, that was something that uh, I think everybody told the Colombian state, you know, once the FARC demobilizes and we have to accept that they really have complied by, by the agreement. I mean, as I said, it, I think it's something like 80, 85% of them have decided to stay uh, in, the, in the legal realm even though uh, a lot of uh, things have been happening to them, you know, the state not abiding by the terms, uh, they are being killed, uh, you know, all the promises are being unfulfilled, and yet they still, the FARC are still, uh, you know, uh, abiding by the agreement. Uh, so, but it, they were told, the state was told, you have to be very quick in, in you know, going to those places once the, the FARC army leaves those spaces, the state has to be there. And not just in a military capacity, which is something that we have always insisted, the state has to be there in a differing capacity. You know, in, in, in for instance, very committed to implementing the peace agreement. You know, that will be, of course, one of the main things to do. And, and again, because of some uh, delays on the part of the Santos administration and the lack of will on the part of the Duke administration that never happened. And of course, now those spaces are being again uh, occupied by, by other forces uh, with all the negative repercussions in terms of uh, the implementation. Thank you, Pedro. As you know, I wrote a brief document for the European Union about the implementation. I, I will share it in the chat because I think we can find so many common points to share. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, the, the latest report from Croc and from CERAC CINET are out. I haven't read it, uh, where they, they evaluate what the implementation is being like, and, and they are very critical uh, of the implementation in some parts. I read a little bit about Catatumbo, for instance, where they say the issue of land, for instance, is nothing. They really have not done anything in terms of giving farmers uh, access to land. So, so yeah. And I do think that there are real problems because of the violence, but also there is an evident lack of will on the part of the current government to implement the agreement. Thank you for that, uh, Pedro. We've got a, a few more questions um, in the chat. Yeah, I'll just go through uh, through them uh, just very quickly. Um, so first question is by uh, Karen. Are your courts helpful in supporting human rights and, and land use issues? Uh, another question by uh, Laura Gracia, who I believe is a former student of uh, Pedro's in Javiariana. The war in Colombia, she says, as, as Pedro puts it, has persisted due to the dispute over the land. And although there is a peace process going on, in reality, the problem is not being managed because the system government Media political elite, big business corporations is not providing a platform that offer education and development to guarantee the life of the rural population. What would be the necessary elements to unblock this process if the government itself continues to be the biggest obstacle to resolving the land uh, dispute? And another question by Sinem. Um, thank you for the presentation. Just a short question, what was, is the role of human rights civil society organizations in mm -hmm. Colombia during the peace building process? Thank you. I, can, could you repeat please the first, the first I didn't understand. Uh, yeah. are, are your courts helpful in supporting human rights and land use issues? How does the, the court? Uh, the court, the judicial system. Oh, the courts, the courts, yeah. I see. Well, you know that there is a, I'm not very familiar with this, perhaps, Joanna, if you can help us here, but I know that there is a jurisdiction that is in charge of resolving all the, the land, uh, the conflicts that have emerged around land. Uh, so there is a part of that, but I really don't know, uh, because there's a whole unit of restitution, and therefore all these, these problems. L are land restitution, yes. Right. But I, so I, they do play a role. It's just that I, honestly don't know to what extent or you know how they operate i'm not sure i just know that the jurisdiction exists so they do play a role uh, the other the other thing uh, yeah laura uh, as you mentioned you know it's a definite lack of will and a lot of a lot of opposition but very powerful sectors in colombia uh, that have undertaken this very very strong campaign to uh, to block to block the all the all the 
matters that are related to, to land, including, if you remember, the issue of, of a, a much modern and current cadastral type of thing, because one of the things that happens in Colombia is that there is a lot of land that is not, uh, not being legalized. Let's say they don't pay taxes, so they are not interested in, in modernizing or, or making it current. Uh, so a lot of opposition to that. A lot of land that was dispossessed from poor farmers that they do not want to give back, of course, and they argue that they acquired it in good faith, that they did not know that it belongs to peasants that were dispossessed. Uh, so all very, very, very uh, problematic. What is the solution? I do think that there are forces in Colombia that are coming together in defense of the, of the agreement that have come to realize that it was not, this is not an automatic implementation that you, you really need a political force behind it to, to support it. And again, I am very hopeful as to the next elections. I do see that the sectors most opposed to the political, to the agreement with the FARC uh, are being weakened and that, um, a, um, you know, a potential coalition of people in favor of implementing the agreement uh, might have a good chance in the next elections. If they are able uh, to uh, leave aside their more personalistic types of objectives and, and put the country uh, or the interest of the country first. We'll see what happens. You know, it's, it's just taking place now. Uh, and, and the last one, because I'm sorry, but, but my memory really betrays me sometimes. Now I don't remember what was the last one. And, oh, the role of civil society. Yep. You, know. you know, again, just a couple of things. One that I really have to uh, vow, you know, to all my countrymen and women who in the midst of so much aggression and violence against them persist and, and, and never give up the struggle for a, a more fair, a more just country uh, with, uh, with real democratic rights being respected for all of us, not just for us, those of us who are privileged in this society. And uh, in terms of the peace agreement, in, in, of the peace process, it was a typical, I don't know if the word in English is consultative, a type of uh, participation. In other words, the negotiators were just two, the FARC and the state. But a lot of spaces opened up for civil society to participate. Uh, again, you know, in, in, in a role of consultation, not, nothing else. And uh, so a lot of uh, uh, fora or forums were opened up in several parts of the country with massive participation from civil society where thousands of proposals were uh, gathered and sent actually to have, uh, you know, to send to the, the, the delegations in Havana. And from what I understand, and if you see the content of the agreement, there were a lot of them taken uh, into consideration. Then there was the issue of uh, some organizations of victims actually going to Havana and meeting with the delegations there. There was the issue of a huge, amazing participation of women's organization, LGBTI community in terms of, uh, a, uh, of what? Of meeting uh, for, the, for the gender approach of the peace agreement, which has been so much um, alabado, you know, praised by, by the international community. But it was just that participation in terms of consultation, not, not direct participation, as I understand, for instance, was the the case of Northern Ireland with the women's coalition and in some other uh, peace processes, but at the local level, like in Mali, for instance. In those terms, we do have participation at the local level, but at the national level in Havana, it was just those, those two actors. But again, if you look at the local level, you find civil society constantly engaged in dialogues with various actors in order to uh, reach some sort of agreement you know, for their uh, respect for for the civilians, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Pedro. And if I can just abuse um, Chair's privileges and ask a, a final question, uh, or, or, or perhaps two, do you think there's a general generational dynamic to um, uh, to the FARC's leadership or the leadership of Los Comunes to agree to the peace agreement? Uh, so you've got Nazir Richani, who who basically argues that the military pressure that uh, put under the, the FARC's leadership, Timoshenko and the others, uh, basically caused them to, to you know, lose energy, you know, uh, lose their, 
you know, confidence mm -hmm. in the war, you know, they, they couldn't survive. And so they came to a peace negotiation where others like Jesus Andrich uh, and other medium level commanders, they were much more optimistic, uh, you know, than the, the more senior aging commanders, who, who many of whom were struggling from health problems. Mm -hmm. And then just a second question, the, much has been said about the, the growth of the FARC during the 1990s, uh, you know, the, the, the momentum that they uh, had at the time, the military victories. It always seems surprising to me why they finally did decide to enter peace negotiations with Pestrana when um, so many people agree that the momentum was on the side of the FARC at that time. Why did they agree uh, to the peace uh, negotiations with Pestrana when they were seemed to have the advantage? Yeah, I guess only they will know, but I'll tell you the versions that I've heard. One was that they never really thought to negotiate with Pastrana, that they were using, uh, you know, this as a political opportunity simply, but that they never really seriously contemplated a negotiated solution. So they knew they were strong. They knew that the negotiations would give them a lot of visibility, that they could, uh, you know, address the Colombian people uh, throughout the peace process but that they were really thinking in terms of, of, of military terms. I also think that is the case for the government. I, I think that this process, uh, both of them were speaking of peace, of peace, not very much convinced of the need to negotiate. And that is also the case of Pastrana because at the same time that he was speaking of peace, he was, uh, you know, the Colombian state was uh, very much preparing for war. And that is what Plan Colombia was. Uh, so, the other thing, if they really meant that they that they thought that they were going to negotiate, well, perhaps because one thing is to be strong militarily and another thing is to win militarily. And let me explain what I mean by that. I'm one of those, uh, you know, my generation, my generation of Latin Americans really thought that things could be changed through armed struggle. Uh, but armed struggle in Latin America just proved to be a disappointment. You know, if you see, for instance, how many dozens of armed groups with a project of change, meaningful change, emerged in Latin America, I think they emerged in every Latin American country, perhaps with the exception of Costa Rica. And, uh, and how many, so it was dozens of revolutionary groups armed. How many of those succeeded? Cuba in 1959, and 20 years later, Nicaragua. Uh, that's it. No more. So, so in, in, in other words, as an instrument for meaningful deep change, structural change, armed struggle in Latin America simply has been a failure. Yeah. So again, they could be very strong, but they could also perhaps learn the lessons of history and say, well, to win the war is different from us being very strong. Look, I, I think that, that very often people, because of uh, a lot of wishful thinking, Forget really why, what's necessary for, in Latin America at least, for these organizations to win the war. And that is, it's not a guerrilla force that is going to defeat an army. It is a guerrilla force accompanied by a general insurrection and mostly an urban general insurrection. Otherwise, what you can have is a very strong guerrilla organization isolated in the rural areas, in control of some parts of the country, but unable to come to the cities and take over government. So, uh, so perhaps they also realize that, you know, we are very strong, but we do not have much contact with the urban centers. We have not been able to manage, you know, to gather strength in the terms of provoking a general insurrection. Let me give you an example of why I say as strong as they were, they were isolated, even though they had 10 units surrounding Bogota and attacked at some point in a town that is only half, half an hour away. But Unlike the guerrillas in El Salvador, the FMLN, which in the final offensive in November, December, 1989, were able to attack several cities, capital cities, provincial capital cities, and the capital city for about a week or 10 days fighting against the army, the FARC never had that capacity. The largest town that the FARC attacked was Mitu. And how big is that? I mean, it's a very small provincial capital, completely isolated. I mean, M19 did better. M19 attacked the, the central park of Florencia Caqueta. So again, they were really strong. They were with the momentum, but that's very different from saying, and they were really about to 
win the war, except from a very simplistic perspective that it is the guerrillas that actually defeat the army. But that's you know my perception. Uh, thank you very much for your, your talk today, uh, Pedro. I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say that it's been a, a really interesting and thorough uh, discussion. We're, we're very privileged and lucky to be able to, to hear this talk. And, um, and, and the CSGJ is very happy to be able to serve as a bridge between uh, Colombian scholarship uh, and, and Britain. So thank you very much for, for spending so much time for us today. No, yeah. thank you, Oliver and all the colleagues for inviting me. Let's hope the next time is actually in England instead of uh, via internet, I'm getting tired of this, you know, we, we, we have to, to meet each other and, and, and talk uh, in the heat of a beer, let's say, as they say in Spanish. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good Thank luck to you, all of you. Cheers. Cheers. See you soon. Thank you, Pedro. Looking forward ciao. to seeing you here. <laughs> Igual, ciao. ciao. Many thanks, Pedro. Jennifer, good to see you too. Good to see you, Pedro, too. <laughs> All right. Bye -bye. I had some questions, but I'll save it for another time. <laughs> <laughs> but we can, we can always talk later. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.